Hi, I'm Betsy Rosenberg, and I am thrilled to be going directly to Glasgow. I am not there, unfortunately. I'm in the States, but we have um, people on the ground that are our eyes and our ears, and we're going to hear from them today, beginning with Alex Carlin. Alex is a most interesting individual. He is a musician uh, going way back to Barrier Roots, where I'm from. We're about the same era. My assistant, Margaret, knows of his band, the Rubenus, back in uh, college days, but he has gone so far uh, from there, still a musician, um, a rock star, uh, I hear, in Russia, but he's done even a lot more than that, which is what brings him to Green TV today, and that is his work as a journalist, as an investigative journalist, as a climate journalist, and also as a um, solutionary in, in the real sense of the term, because he has been working on uh, one of the approaches I had not heard much about, and that is all about ocean pasture restoration. Uh, and we're going to hear about his path from um, musician to solutionary and a few important points in between. This is not his first rodeo. This is not his first cop. Uh, he went to Copenhagen, as we'll hear. Hopefully this one is not Nopenhagen, but there is some Hopenhagen happening <laughs> in uh, Glasgow. Uh, Alex, thanks so much for joining us um, and uh, great to see you in the main room. Uh, it's there and it's quiet because it's Sunday uh, evening there and we're really thrilled to have you. Uh, I know you, we, ha we have some time, not enough, never enough to get to everything we want to talk about, uh, including our oceans on acid and your idea for solving that as well as other things. Um, so we'll jump right in, but just give our viewers a bit of a background. Um, you are someone who's been making music for a long time, but you have taken that to a new level, but you're also bringing it back to your activism. Yeah, it's true. It's always been connected, though. I mean, from the initial, um, I noticed that, well, I'm having such a fantastic time touring and I'm playing 100 concerts a year, in, for example, in Russia in the last several years. And, and it's just, my life is just getting better every day. And I thought, well, what could stop it, you know? And, and you start to hear about, you know, cl climate ruin. And I'm like, well, I guess that could stop my, my touring. And that I think started getting me motivated, right? But then like, as uh, you know, the thing was, there was, it really started in 2009 when I was based in Krakow and I had some concerts in Denmark and right there in Copenhagen, I was talking to my friend, John Staubers, this brilliant, uh, fellow who created the, the organization that I blog for right now, the Center for Media and Democracy. And John said, well, well you're going to be in Copenhagen. Why don't you, uh, why don't you blog? Why don't you, uh, you know, do that and, and, and interview everybody and learn something and write about it. And, you know, we'll pay you, you know, so it'll be great. Just, just start this thing. And it, it tur that turned into this wonderful 12 years really where they're sending me, you know, to Lima, Peru, to Paris, to Morocco, and even when John left, we had Lisa Graves, who's fantastic, uh, executive director after that. And then now Arne Pearson, I mean, these guys are amazing journalists. Um, you know, people who, who put it this way, they tell me I have complete freedom of the press. I can say everything, presuming, you know, I'm telling the truth, of course, which I am, but they, they'll back me up, you know, completely, no matter what I want to say. So I'm dealing with, dealing with a really wonderful news organization. So that's allowed me to, to, to have have a lot of fun with this, really. And tell us about the Russia connection. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of some of your solutions. I mean, I was in the Soviet Union at the very end for six months with my band, my American band, and we toured all the way, you know, into the Siberian area and into the what used to be the Ukrainian SSR, the you know the Ukrainian part of the Soviet Union, and and every every part of it, we really became. Uh, we had a really wonderful uh, opportunity to experience the Soviet Union right before it ended, which was a wild period because it, people were not getting, you know, with, you know, was, they were not getting kidnapped out of their homes in, into the gulag at that point. It was more like even the cops were sympathetic to whatever demonstrations were going on. Like, for example, we've supported a demonstration in Siberia uh, by playing a concert in the, in the main square. Um, where we took the power from the metro system and we set up, and there's a huge crowd of people and, and the, uh, the, the, the banners behind our band said, this territory is free from communism, you know, and this is before the communism had ended really. And the police didn't care. So it was a very fluid Soviet union at the time. And, but the point is that we, um, at that point, I really fell in love with the people of Russia and the whole culture there. And I never forgot it. And, but there was a big break and, and about 10 years ago, I started going back again. And it, the interesting thing is it became the best place for me to tour 
I could it probably take too long to explain, but uh, but in a, in a nutshell, there is no better country for me to do what I like to do, which is be on the road all the time and play a concert, fill the calendar, you know, with concerts. Um, I'm trying to reach the uh, the goal of James Brown of 300 concerts a year, but I've reached like 100. And why yeah. is the music especially popular there? Well, it's just, they love, you know, they're just game for anything in, in Russia. The, the thing is there is no, the bars don't close. I mean, why would you close the bar? You know, it's like, it's this kind of a country. It's like, they're just, ready for anything and and the adventure never stops so it that is that's to me it's like the analogy of what like when i grew up in berkeley in the 60s that's what the, that's where it was that was what berkeley in the 60s was all about and now as much as i love america for being the united states of rock and roll it's a little more like walking on eggshells and things you know get a little more conservative in terms of uh the, the insanity and craziness that can go on and and so that's why I, I prefer to to be in Russia in places where it's I get that feeling. I have this I have I recognize that that spirit. It's sort of that's where to me, rock and roll is most alive in Russia than any other country. And what is the name of your group there? Um, Alex Carlin Ben. Alex Carlin Ben. OK, so easy to find you. <laughs> so uh, I have so many different directions to take this. But before I we probably won't get back to it if I don't ask now, what is the state of consciousness about our climate crisis there in Russia because Putin isn't there, China's not there. That really started things off, you know, Glasgow on a down note, but it seems like things are, that's not stopping people, it can't stop people. No, it's it's misleading to say, I mean, I, I, the, the, the leaders of those nations, like Putin and leader of China, they're not here, but there's delegations here. You know, I, I go there several times already to the, uh, the Russian pavilion and where the Russian, the office where all the delegates are, there's plenty of delegates are, they're working, they're doing things. It's a little bit of a misnomer when you read about it in the press, you know, this thing about Russia's not here. It's not true. They're here. Was it meant to send a signal? And if so, what? How do you interpret Putin's not being there or sending you know, someone I, I, as his let me, emissary? I'll put, no, I'll put it this way. I've been very uh, pleasantly surprised by a lot of the the press releases and the edicts and the decrees and the things coming out of of the Kremlin and things like that are they're, they're definitely a big movement from this sort of denialism kind of you know putting it in a category that you don't really have to make it uh, too much of a priority you know that has definitely gone you know that train left the station and now it's they're very much you know acknowledging it and making moves and talking about uh, where you know russia is going to be fitting in and things like you know they're they're talking about their forests and and that's where i where i'm coming in with what i'm bringing to the table which is they have a great opportunity to do the ocean pasture restoration it's really exciting and and um russia is definitely going to be one of the countries that's going to be moving there and doing that they're they're also very reliant on their supply of oil so how do you see that yeah i mean that thing but Right, they're concerned about that certainly, and and but what I will mention one thing because you know there's plenty of uh, criticism going around with every country, and certainly Russia gets you know is, is, well, there's plenty of criticism to go uh, in to every government and to every nation. But I will say just to um, mention things that people don't ordinarily hear, I heard uh, I was talking to somebody who's an expert in rivers, for example, and it turns out that russia takes better care of their rivers than just about any other country they they care more about um things that other countries don't you know in terms of how you know when the, the baby fish go out to the eddies and eat and come back you know the, the the whole care of the of the ocean of the river is getting a better treatment in russia than than in the west interesting so, you know i mean speaking you of can, uh, we'll go from rivers to oceans maybe so we make sure we get to your um, exactly. Your solution. Sure. Yeah. It's it's it's. Here's the thing. We're, this is the solutionaries program, and I definitely want to cut to the chase. Um, and it's really that if you look at um, the media narrative, it essentially says it's all about emissions reduction. And any casual observer will say, "Yeah, we just need clean cars faster, and we'll be okay." And it turns out that was really a very true statement. If we were uh, in 1971, let's say. So let's say 50 years ago, that would have really carried the day. Yeah, okay. 
because there wasn't as much CO2 in the atmosphere as there is today. Today, we have a one trillion ton extra amount of CO2 as um, a greenhouse effect. You can think of it as a blanket. You can think of it as something that is uh, going to um, be there even if by, with a magic wand, we had emissions reduction down to zero tomorrow morning, that blanket would still be there. And that, you know, uh, sort of microwave would be cooking us yeah. and we would have to do something about it just like we do now. So the, the, the emissions reduction is extremely important. It's absolutely mandatory. We have to have it in a big way, in a bigger way and I, than anybody is even saying, you know, I, I totally support that, but it's, a, it's really only half because you have to do the other half, which is repurpose or remove CO2 that is increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases, which is why we're all here in, in Glasgow. It's all about the greenhouse effect and making it less. And I'd, if, I'd like to take it one more um, aspect, Please. if you don't mind. It's no. that it's in terms of, you know, you could call it the paradigm. The old paradigm is let's limit the damage to certain amount of degrees and sort of hope for you know the level of misery and torture and massive death to be less oh, than it might be if we did nothing or something like this right and this is the old paradigm and the new paradigm says no hold on a second we the new paradigm is climate restoration and that means it's still possible it's very possible it simply is possible to restore the CO2 concentration levels back to 300 or less, something that we is a proven safe number. Not even, I mean, beyond 350, 350 maybe, but really 300 is what's safe and proven. And so, you know, that's really the, the paradigm and that's really the goal. And, 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 the only, and the reason why we can say that and in terms of being feasible, practical, and you know, not wasting anybody's time is due to the oceans. The oceans have the capacity naturally to do it with photosynthesis. The key word here is photo is plankton and photosynthesis. Those are the t two key phenomena that you we should really know more about because plankton is our best. There are they are our best friends and allies. Besides being incredibly beautiful, if you look at them under a microscope, they really do am amazing things. And they're getting crowded out by plastic. Yikes. Yeah. Well, yeah, the see, plastic pollution and overfishing and all those things are, are bad things. But we're talking about something else that is a diff that is more significant in terms of the climate. You know, and, and the thing is that when you talk, for example, about the Amazon forest as being the way that we're going to, you know, remove CO2 because trees breathe in that CO2. And we all know that. So we call Amazon lungs of the planet. But it turns out that underwater, there are 50 Amazon equivalent underwater forests, historically 50, with 50 times that photosynthesis power, that power to take the CO2. That's real capacity to give us a chance. All, you know, many of these other so-called solutions, you know, are less, are, to me, you have to study, you have to really take a hard look at what they, how much they scale and how fast they happen and how much they cost and if anybody's actually going to do it, all those things. The ocean is right there. And, and, the, and everybody, you know, the, the creatures of the ocean will love you if you retur restore their health. The, especially the, the, the mollusks, mollusks, especially the mollusks. I can't pronounce well, that. The hard shells yeah. that are getting disintegrated because well, let me let me get to the acid yeah. and, and that's one thing that 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 plankton does and with this photosynthesis when you have when you increase the photosynthesis by restoring the health of the pasture which i'll explain in a minute that then you have to think okay that co2 that's been in the atmosphere that's interacting with the ocean and creating acidic molecules which is causing ocean acidification that phenomena will change to where that same CO2, instead of creating an acidic molecule, will create plankton and other life forms. And that becomes part of the ocean ecology, the living ecology of the ocean. And that's the absolutely the biggest thing you could do to 
um, to resolve that problem of acidification. So ocean pasture restoration, is that the work of Russ George? That's exactly right. It's exactly right. And, and, and that's what brings the health back in. So I need to, at this point, describe well, why, what's wrong? What happened to the ocean? Why is it not photosynthesizing at its historical levels? What happened, right? And there's a very interesting reason for that, an interesting little narrative that's, that you can ask any ocean scientist after watching this show, and he'll tell you that's right, that's exactly correct. It's not controversial. It, it has to do with uh, the fact that the dry land masses like the Sahara Desert, Gobi Desert, they have been the source of this uh, mineral rich dust that the wind picks up and the wind carries that mineral rich dust over the oceans and drops it into the oceans kind of randomly. But that's how those pastures are um, become healthy. And it's an exact analogy to a land farmer looking for rainfall. But the ocean farmer is looking for dustfall, mm. okay? And we've had 10,000 years to develop our skills as land farmers tending the land, you know, responsibly and well. This is the dawn of the new era of ocean farmer um, tending pastures and learning how to do that in the best possible way. And so, oh, the land farmer wants rainfall where we here in the ocean are looking for dustfall. And it turns out, that there's been a 50 year dust fall drought. And I can tell you why. There's an actual reason for that. And which is um, the industrialization has caused, um, has caused CO2 to accumulate in the atmosphere to the extent that as you know, think about grassy, grassy areas will get a little more moist, a little wetter when there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. That's just a fact. And despite all the desertification that's all over the planet, despite that fact, much more significant is that that extra CO2 has caused the dry land masses in places like the Sahara and the Gobi Desert. Those dry land masses are getting just enough more moist that you get less dust blowing in the wind. Mm. And that is another thing. Any ocean scientist will say it's true. 50 years uh, we've had of less dust. Every, they, they, all, they will all tell you that's true. And, and so you get, yeah. Most of us think of as dust as something a nuisance, but you're talking about nutrient-rich dust. Nutrient-rich dust. Marine life. That's what cultivates and makes a healthy ocean pasture, which is, by the way, there's more biomass in those ocean pastures than all of the land forests and everything like that. We, we're land creatures. We look out at the water and we see a blue, flat something, and we have no idea what's going on, right? Turns right. out it's really important and really good news. It's, it's the only, it's when, can you ask me at one point about, you know, journalism and music. And the other thing is that now the United Nations asks me to give presentations on this stuff, specifically to the youth, Yungo back in Poland a couple of years ago at the COP, because somebody's got to give some, you know, some hope or something to tell people uh, who are younger that, um, you know, it's not all over. It's not hopeless. You know, there's something that to really work for here mm -hmm. that makes sense. You know, and it's uh, as gr green and groovy as you can get, really. And so what's the state of play with this process? Is it being um, utilized? And if so, where? Yes, well, that's a, it's a great question. It, it was done 10 years ago in Alaska to huge success. When, and it, let, me before, let me back up one thing to, to show uh, the last part of the process to understand is that when baby salmon are in the river and they go out into the... As most people know, they swim out as babies and they go into the deep ocean. What people don't know is where they're going. They're going to the eddies and the eddies is where they eat food, right? And if the eddies don't have food, they, the little babies die. And that's the biggest reason why the fish populations of all the big fish, because there's, you know, they are way, way down. And it's partly because of overfishing, plastics and pollution, but it's more because there's no food in the eddies. Turns out that's a bigger reason. And so that's what ocean pasture restoration is all about, is put is replacing just tiny amounts of that d mineral rich dust that was blowing in on the, and you can sweep it up off of a construction floor. I mean, this is really inexpensive, natural. It's just, you know, it's well, iron. Little it's, dust will do? Yeah, little dust will do, absolutely. absolutely. And it will, it's so much, so small, like it's, it's like salt shakers full over, they say, well, you can look at photosynthesis as chlorophyll, like nodes on your finger, like if every, each of your finger was a node for, you know, the tip 
of it needs one atom of iron um, to be robust in photosynthesis, right? It's something like just, I'm oversimplifying it, but that's the model of why it's so cheap, easy, fast, you know, no problem to, to, re, to you know, restore an ocean pasture. This is really good news. So, so do that, planes you ask go up and it, spray dust? What's that? Do airplanes go up and sprinkle dust? Well, How no, 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 that's not, no, 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 it's gotta be much more. Well, here's what happened. So 10 years ago, an Indian tribe who's the translation of the name was people of the salmon and they had no salmon and they asked um, somebody they knew who is a restorer of ecosystems, right? Um, his name is Russ George and they asked, hey, say Russ, you know, you've been doing such a great job with the trees planting like 250 million trees in Canada, you know, and we've been talking about some of these subjects, you know, they, they knew each other and they're friendly. Let's go and restore our salmon. And they went out and did it. So he goes out with the uh, local um, tribes people after a year of studying it, getting every uh, permission from every government, uh, you know, bureaucracy that they needed in Canada. Can Canadian government was fully supporting it. And they went out there and the, the tribe was fully supporting it. They had meetings. Everything was in line. Everything were great. And they went out on a boat. So what you do is you go out on a boat and you just, you have a way of using a hose to like, you have a mixture, you know, of coming out of a, of a vessel. And that goes out into the eddies that you've scientifically, you know, figured what are the best ones. And you kind of canvas, you do a little canvassing for a couple of weeks. You, you slowly take your boat, go back and forth. And what happened very quickly, the plankton come back, the, the fish, oh, there's food, the fish from hundreds of miles away, somehow or other, know about it and they started swimming to this thing and the birds follow the animals because they eat the you know the fish and the and the, and one of the, and Russ was saying that one of the tribes guys said hey, Russ come up on on deck we can't even hear the 90 decibel engines because there's so many birds singing they can't believe there's food you know and and then the guy he gets a phone call from Russ the, all the whales we were watching just swam over to you why are they doing that you know oh, wow. so it, was just, it was an unbelievable uh, you know thing that happened about 10 years and it's it's been slow to do the next one but we're all over the planet you know and what what's but what what it's been called recently is the, the whole concept is 100 villages and the, the the meaning behind 100 villages is you don't need bill gates you don't need to wait for a government you don't need to wait for pelosi and the republicans to you know come to an agreement on anything because you don't need taxpayer money you don't require that you need Nation states have to cooperate and they have to, you know, make uh, make everything, uh, you know, they have to want to do it and go into partnerships, but not the, but they don't need to supply, they don't need to, to financially you know, support it because of the money is so small. So it's not about money, believe it or not. You know, if you get these trillion dollar plans as solutionary solutions and to me, uh, you know, it's a lot better if it's free, right? You know, so well, it's essentially cost. free. Even and I'll tell you what, it's not free, but it, of course, but it's Relative. nearly almost you get the money back just from the fish, right? The fish populations coming back generate incredible amount of economic, economic activity, like happened 10 years ago. They, the reported figure was, I forget what it is now, it's hundreds of millions of dollars to Alaska, even just Alaska, even though the, the event was actually of British Columbia but it, it affects the whole area. So it's just only good news. So if our oceans are sucking up a lot of our carbon dioxide, are yeah. you saying that this is a way to offset that? Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, how does, that, and that process is gonna continue, the oceans absorbing? A little bit apples and oranges there. What, what I'm saying is that, yeah, I mean, oceans are a sink and all this stuff. You can imagine where, what the, where the CO2 might be. But in this case, it's it's more um, I think useful to think of it as when is the CO2 interacts with um, the chlorophyll and the and the, and the and the plankton, the phytoplankton, really the light plankton, and and what you get, what the result really is life. It's more more plankton, more fish. So so it's the ecosystem of the ocean is getting larger. There's more fish. There's more kelp. Maybe there's more plant life is it's like an oh it's like a land forest like that's how people talk about oh it's so wonderful we'll have all these forests to take out co2 well it's way more in the ocean and a lot of that does end up being um 
sinking to the bottom, like 25% of that, you could say, would go to the bottom of the ocean for millennia, but more of it actually stays within the living biomass of the, of the ocean, but it doesn't go back up in the atmosphere. That's the point. And does it matter if it's deep or shallow where you sprinkle? Very much. Oh, very. I'm really glad you, you just asked that question. It's a hugely important question, and I'll tell you why. First of all, this whole ocean pasture restoration only happens and only works in the deep ocean. And, and that's where the eddies are. But the reason why it's important to talk about it is that there's these huge misconceptions that there's any danger whatsoever about doing this in terms of toxic algae. Like you see those signs, red algae, don't go swimming or don't eat the mussels or things like that, right? That doesn't, that's a completely different area because that's shoreline you know, problems. And yes, uh, and those shorelines have run off from farms and rivers and all these factories. And that, those environments are completely different. They have tons of iron, tons of, you know, and so, you know, Oper would never exist ever on a shoreline area. And it turns out that we're doing it in the deep ocean, those toxic um, um, life forms cannot even exist out there. I did. I wrote an article. We'll link to it later, hopefully, in this thing. I, it's called "Misconceptions Shouldn't Stop Promising," you know, solutions to the climate problem. And and I got scientists to back, you know, to testify to this that it there is actually, um, it, it's it's essentially totally unfounded, is what the scientists. That's the, how they use the language, unfounded to say that there's any risk or any danger of toxic problems and things unfounded and and the other but the layman's argument for that that i like you know i'm i'm not a trained scientist right my layman's way of thinking about it is is likes likes the likes this um thing i want to um tell you about which is that there have been studies for uh hundreds of years of 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 the of these ocean areas and during those centuries, Mother Nature has dumped many, many times the exact mineral-rich dust that, that OPR does. The same thing I'm talking about in, with volcanoes, with dust storms, huge, gigantic tidal waves of dust. You've seen these pictures. Nature has been doing it for, since for eons, has been dumping exactly what I'm talking about, but in thousands to millions of times bigger quantities. Okay larger and there's never been one recorded um deleterious or dangerous or any effect ever recorded in the history of science and it's, believe me science you know studies these areas they would they would have written about it mm -hmm. you know more or less so that's a pretty interesting proof like well then how could it possibly be dangerous and then you read the reports that say oh it's dangerous and you read deeper into the report and you see they're really referring to coastal areas or you know, completely hypothetical things that are that a scientist would say, well, that's really impossible by nature of, of the organisms. So we have dead zones, but that's a problem along the shore. So that well, would yeah, not be affected either the same, way by this. That's an analogous thing. Those those arguments, yeah, they also don't exist in the deep ocean. It's not with 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 the kind of activity that OPR does. OPR spends a year, let's say, studying an an eddy, an area with eddies and it chooses which eddies that they're going to restore. And they go out there with these little salt shakers full of dust and somebody shouldn't really complain about that because there's no chance it's gonna be dangerous. You know, It's just not the real world. And is it realistic to think that salt shakers full of dust are gonna save us? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, what's, that's the phenomenon. You know, It's actually more like a hundred tons when you add it up because you canvas for a few weeks. You know, You're putting the salt shakers all over the place. But it's nothing like what nature does. It's thousands to million times less dust than nature's uh, events. But but you're saying enough if expanded really could make a game changing difference. Oh, something. Let me put it this way. I just heard this um, from uh, an expert that if the if, if the kind of ocean pasture restoration that we're talking about would be, um, for example, Sir David King. You remember him, and he's he was the the, the number one advisor to the UK prime minister and now he's got a, a group in Cambridge for climate repair he has he was thinking yeah you know 30 gigabyte 30 gigatons 30 gigatons of um of co2 would be a reasonable amount to expect from opr and he's a big 
promoter of up i mean he 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 puts it high on his list like virtually the top of his list of what we should be doing hmm. um and so he's you know to me it's a little conservative but it's fine you know you could say 30 gigatons but what he's really referring to according to this other expert it's only that's only three percent of the ocean surface three percent if you if you're concerned with three percent you're getting 30 gigatons so you can imagine there's a lot of more eddies than three percent so let's bring it back to Glasgow. Now you gave a presentation on this. What was the response? Was People heard of it. Were they like mind? Were their minds blown, or were they skeptical? Um, I'm sure you interacted with people who who heard you speak. Well, so far it's been so excellent um, for my esprit de corps because I'm the message that I keep getting is that's the good news. You know, we really need around here. You know. Mm -hmm. it's you know we need something and, and and it seems and they nobody has you know had any problem with with it on any uh you know on, on any aspect of the science of it or not it, it seems to be exactly what the cop is all about we want to come up with a solution to the greenhouse effect mm -hmm. so and share that here we go and share here them. we go and there's yeah. been a lot of talk about net zero certainly not just in glasgow um one of your blogs said uh some people were mumbling more like knit zero so yeah, would you well, yeah. would you say yeah. um, halfway through this halfway through this conference that um the mood is more optimistic pessimistic or depends on the day where you go what generation you're talking to well you know it's people here are pretty savvy on many levels and it's like i spent the day we can talk about the the street the radical um movement people who i have a lot of respect for a lot of those guys are incredibly sharp tens of thousands of people listened. turned out in the streets yesterday on saturday amazing yeah. it was wonderful i was there and and talked to a lot of people and i'll Not go into that Glasgow, around the world too which is also very encouraging yeah. no that's right and it's, it's well it's reaching the point where you know, as cities are eliminated off the map of California from getting burned right off the map. And as, you know, farms or, you know, people are coming and saying, hey, the farm that we lived on can't grow crops anymore. You know, that's how about that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's serious, okay? And, and, and pretty soon it'll be too hot to work in the tropics. And if you can't work and you can't grow food, you know, that's climate ruin, right? That's it. So we don't, we're, we're trying to let make sure that doesn't happen, you know, worse than it is already. And so the thing is that people, and here's, here's the thing about net zero. So let me comment on that because obviously, you know, this, uh, I, the, the spawn, you know, the sponsorship of, you know, these cops is clearly, you know, pretty high end, high, high level corporations trying to perhaps greenwash, you know, we give them the benefit of the doubt, but the 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 point is like something you know net zero fits into the unfortunate greenhouse type of paradigm of let's just do everything we can to not do anything kick which the is carbon like, can down the road which is why we're in this yeah, right. right now right exactly no precisely yeah. and though you have to understand that those people you know that's how they got to their you know position in their corporation is by that that, that sort of activity so that's what they're trained to do and and the thing that's great about o, OPR is that we we don't need them, right? We go out or they go out. The villages, hundred villages, goes out and restores their ocean village fishing pasture, restores their village fishing fishing pasture out in the ocean near them, and they don't need uh, any corporation uh, to do anything really. So the the thing that the corporations are doing though is that they're 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 making a problem of emissions of future additional emissions so we have to be very hardcore about about that and making that you know you could call it an eco crime or something you could say well it's an eco crime now to put out that much co2 so we're going to you know find the right court jurisdiction and take you to court and make you stop you know those kind of things are very relevant and, and people around here you know but but the powers that be you know the sponsorship of the cops are not going that direction because they're still, you know, somehow or other, you know, they're they're actually advocating something that doesn't really do the math, right? That's why the, that's this whole net zero controversy is all about. 
and they call it net i call it net zero because i hang out in russia right but it's <laughs> funny but 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 not zero is what the people call it and um and what they're saying is it's not it's not real zero it's just phony zero because you're paying somebody to do something good to allow you to continue to uh, put co2 in the atmosphere and maybe that is a kind of a if that if that if the people doing the good thing were not ordinarily going to do that and they're only doing it because you pay them you could maybe at best say that you created kind of a of a wash or something kind of a neutral effect like, like carbon offsets on a grander scale right. yeah something like, and i want to mention that in a second but the point is that sometimes those people would be doing it anyway and they're just getting paid to get you know some money and so the point being that you know, net zero is extremely, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very undesirable uh, movement or certainly it's not, it doesn't do the math and it's not going to uh, solve the problem. And, and it's very clear to the, the people um, who, who are, you know, marching out on, yesterday, there's nothing more clear than that, that they're, they're not being fooled by that, right? It's just a feel good slogan. Well, here we are, it's almost 2022. We have till 2030 to cut our emissions in half. And do you feel no. like there's any way that can happen uh, with or without ocean pasture well, restoration? Well, I, no, right. Well, I look at it completely differently. I don't I don't think that any of their uh, sort of, uh, uh, let's say formulas ha are very, uh, are the right ones. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it from a completely object, um, out, uh, outsider point of view and I'm saying, yeah, OPR has to be there, things like that, you know, to remove CO2, let's say at 30, 40, 50 gigatons a year. But right now, humans are putting out 43 or something like that. So you have to be. So my formula for uh, re, for reducing emissions fast enough, honestly, the, um, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, I think we need to set up a system of uh, a legal system of, of eco eco crime, eco uh jurisprudence eco. eco side we have to stop eco side, eco side. Eco, yeah. yes it's all about eco crime and 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 because at this point nothing seems to work they're not doing it on a voluntary basis put it that way you know the market's and then, and then they're not making solving it, it surprise <laughs> the markets yeah right right the republican solution exactly. the only republican solution traditionally yeah it's it's this you know it's hard to imagine that they think they're going to survive this but they they kind of have a track record they think that they can buy their way out of anything in a gated community or something and they won't suffer but they will you know so it's really short-sighted for everybody but we so we can you know eventually uh educate them we hope but but in the meantime it's it's i believe um and I, i'm only just starting to think about this but i believe that it, you have to move into the area of eco crime and and led and things like you know penal codes right you have to start writing the new penal codes because it's that serious like you know it's not at a certain point because we you know i'll tell you what we had some really interesting conversations last night with the uh hardcore guys who were out there outside the cop you know doing the demonstrations doing the marches and they're really thoughtful people and they're and they're struggling with you know i'm talking about people like extinction rebellion those guys and and similar groups and they are struggling with well you know it's such an emergency that we are blocking traffic and making working class people angry and a lot you know and they struggle with the idea the idea that that kind of disruption is the only tool in the toolbox because it it does turn off you know people who could be their uh allies because they can't get to work or something right so you have it's it's a really rich field now of of tech of tactics of of discussing um what are the next tactics going to be right because it's getting to the point where people can't take it anymore right it's going to be so they're going to i think we need all tactics we need everything we need extinction rebellion yeah. because those people who get pissed off they weren't going to be doing much with the climate anyway i would i would wager right. not soon sure. enough and not on mass no absolutely and and the, the extinction rebellion people have come to the conclusion that it's worth irritating people because it's so bad and and that's not i'm not disagreeing at all with that but I'm saying we need more. That's only one tool in the toolbox right, right, and it's right. not exactly working, right? So it's like, I, I think more in terms of let's really uh, 
let's call it call a spade, but call it an eco crime, call a crime what it is. And and what's you know it's, it that kind of crime kills more people than a lot of other crimes, right? So I mean, there's a lot of basis for setting up a legal uh, a criminal system, a penal code for uh, emission for CO2 emissions. It's just like you know if 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 a corporation uh, you know poisons a well, that's a crime, right? So what's the difference? Why is that any different than somebody who's been warned plenty of times just to, you know, to change from fossil fuels to renewable? We gave you a warning. Okay, now it's over, right? Yeah. And I don't know why that hasn't happened yet. I, I you know, I think it should we should already be there already. Well, um what, what about I want to talk a little bit more about just the mood there. Uh, you know, Greta and her many, many followers, not just in Glasgow, but around the world, you know, are kind of enjoying her blah, blah, blah. And, and there's certainly a lot of truth to that too much. And yet yeah. um, I read one article that said it, it's not fair for her to just, you know, throw water on the whole process because this is the best we've got. What's your sense of that? Okay, now let me say something really positive about cops because I was kind of denigrating them a little bit. I love the cops and I'm telling, I want to tell you some reasons. I think despite all of the fact that, you know, they're corporate sponsors and they're, do, they're trying to do things we don't like. To me, I just put that completely aside because the positive side of the cops is so big for me. Just the kind of people you meet, you come here, the people that I've met, people that anybody else is gonna meet, just that, you know, it's from every corner of the globe, you just can't, and they're so smart and they're so interesting and they educate you so much and they give you a perspective. And, and it's for two weeks, you're just with and interacting, drinking coffee and just all of that stuff, the pavilions, just, you can't imagine how important, especially in this, everybody's, you know, socially distancing and staying at home kind of age to actually be in a place where you're still meeting these people is so invaluable and so, and that's what one of the things that, that gives me hope and like in terms of people say, well, you know, those the, the masters of the universe, you know, the people, the elites, they're just, how are you gonna get them to, to do the right thing? You know, how many, how many times do you have to, how, you can't just bang them on the head until they change, you know? And, but you can do things while they're being foolish you can do things that you're doing, you know, and and supersede them eventually and transcend them in your own ways by doing things on your own. And like they say, we are the solutions. We're the people we're waiting for. That was a good slogan. Yeah. And well, and, and the deniosaurs, as I call them, will die off uh, because it is mostly older yeah. white men. Sorry, right. it is. Um, but but we don't have time to wait for that. So it's got to happen. <laughs> it's it's yeah, yeah. And, it's definitely like it is, let me say some good things about Greta too, because I met her in Poland actually. You know, the, Stuart Scott brought her and brought me. We brought a lot of people together, um, and we went out. And there was a big march in Poland on the like like yesterday, but in Poland, and that's where I had my guitar. And we, and that was the day that I came. Just occurred to me this chant for the because the march would stop and the flatbed truck flatbed truck would. Uh, have the mics and then they would get people like me to play a couple songs and I just, it just hit me to have this big chant that was like coal gas and oil we left it in the soil it's kind of looking back from the future we left the coal gas and oil in the soul in the soil and and I'm, I'm just saying that, that Greta during that whole time was a big inspiration to everybody just because she's just this tiny little girl who's just so much you know spirit and so much uh uh energy and positive uh kind of a kind of a instigation in the way she talked you know but but the thing by, that, by speaking very plainly and simply but profoundly i think that's a lot yeah, of it propels people that way and and the reason and the thing that i really admire was that she her, her essential message was listen to the scientists and take it seriously and do what they say which is good because it doesn't get into trouble with what i have criticism of of when people think it's only emissions reduction, we're gonna super glue ourselves to like Exxon's front door until they stop emitting when that's that's okay, but it's only half the problem. So, but she's saying, well, well, what do the scientists say? And I would say the scientists would agree with me that, you know, if you had emissions reduction tomorrow morning, you'd still better pull out some CO2 or we're gonna have a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And when people say to me, uh, oh, my generation, fellow boomers will say, let, let Greta and, her generation saw that they care about it. They're going to live into it. I say, well, what is Greta saying? What are they saying? Uh, listen to science. I said, well, what else? 
they're also imploring us, we adults, to do everything we can in our power while we can so they can stay in school, get educated, and hope to have a future worth living into. And that's what drives me crazy is it's not up to the kids to solve it. They're begging us appropriately, yelling at us appropriately to do our part so they have a chance. And if we don't try and show them in a big way, we're doing everything we can now that we know what we know and acknowledging what we know and have known for more time than some people would like to admit um, that they that's going to give them hope and 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 aren't saying you guys you got it you you figure it out good luck that's the opposite of giving them hope yeah that's not a very you know admirable outlook you know like of course the you know, native people say seven generations that's how you that's your outlook and you don't you know you're borrowing it from your kids and you should well, you know it's, it's also it's also a cop out to say let them they'll figure it out you know they're they get it more than we do so we we can just play golf till we retire you know no right well you know it's obviously that you know what she's what she's really saying also is the whole thing about well it's an emergency so let's treat it like an emergency and that's her blah 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 thing which is they they say the words emergency without any action that is commensurate with that word emergency. Obviously, if you look at what's going on, it's, she's completely correct. Exactly. And it's a great message. It's, a, it's an absolutely great message. Exactly. Um, we're running out of time and it looks like a little bit of battery. So um, I wonder if we have, let's see, could you, I would love to hear a little bit of your song, if you could play yeah, that. Just a little bit. Um, tell me, like, um, it's come, it's, written in 2051 and looking back on today 2021 it's like it was a runaway train headed for a crash out of control gonna totally smash all our hope was gone or so it seemed but the cities were all going underwater seemed like no way to save it for your son or daughter it even just about almost fooled me it's climate ruin hey what were we doing bessie what were we doing we were messing everything up for everyone but now it's climate restoration hey we did the calculations Woo! and now we're pulling out the co2 by the gigaton all right all right now come on do you feel it now oh yeah Woo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I feel it now. I feel it now. <laughs> well, the powers that be were getting us in a panic. You might even say they were, or oh, you might even say they were acting satanic. But what kind of fools we mortals be? Got we took control of the situation and instituted climate restoration. And everybody finally agreed to let it be. Yeah, we let it be. Climate restoration, hey, it's time for celebration. Yeah, because we listened to Russ George and restored the oceans to the max. Now, wait a minute, I want to do that chant we did with Greta in Poland. Can you chant with me, Betsy? Come on now. <laughs> Coal, gas, and oil. We left it in the soil. Coal, gas, and oil. Come on. We left it in the soil. Sing it now. Coal, gas, and oil. We left it in the soil. Yeah. Coal, gas, and oil. We left it in the soil. I can't sing. <laughs> Got a voice for radio, maybe TV, but not for singing. <laughs> Climate restoration is for the future generation. Climate restoration. We even saved the Arctic ice from elimination. Ocean capture restoration to give a kids a healthy nation. It was climate ruin. Woo! But we saw that storm brewing. We saw the storm brewing back in 2020 or so, you know. But you know what, Betsy? I think at that time, people were giving up hope and they thought it was all over, right? I know a lot of people did, but back in 2021, we actually got on the right road. Not a moment too soon. And we're going to say goodbye, not a moment too soon, because my battery's about to die. My bad. I forgot to plug it in. That was so inspiring, Alex Carlin. Thank you so much. Glad you like. Let's hope we don't fade to black. <laughs>